morning is called He Healed All the Sick. Simple title, but profound truth. Now, again, this, this is going to cover points that are challenging for us, and it's going to press against a lot of our sense of, are we going too far with this? And I just want to invite you in an appeal. Let us gather around the scripture and reason together. What does the scripture say? And allow scripture to speak for itself. And I, and, I, and I say this up front, church. There are extremes and there are abuses in anything that is God. And there are those who have come out of abusive ministries that have taken this and marketed it in ways that are not honoring to God. Praise God for wisdom to escape that and to rebuke that. But we have to be careful that we're not following and listening to people who come out of that with an ax to grind. And because it was abused, it's all bad. Throwing the, the quote a phrase, the baby out with the bathwater. Just because it's abused doesn't change the fact that it's the truth. Is Jesus still healing today? Is it still God's will to heal us today? And what does this mean for our lives and for our witness as we represent Jesus in this world? <clears throat> I want to begin with uh, just a sense of identity. Who are we as a Cornerstone Chapel? Many of you are aware we are part of a Christian and Missionary Alliance. Our founder, Reverend A.B. Simpson, 19th century, wrote this in his work entitled The Gospel of Healing. Man has a twofold nature. He is both a material and a spiritual being. And both natures have been equally affected by the fall. That's when sin came into our world. We'll look at that in a minute. <clears throat> we would therefore expect that any complete scheme of redemption would include both natures and provide for the restoration of his physical as well as the renovation of his spiritual life. <clears throat> Nor are we disappointed. The Redeemer appears among men with both hands stretched out to our misery and our need. In the one he holds salvation, in the other healing. He offers himself to us as a complete savior. His indwelling spirit, the life of our spirit. His resurrection body, the life of our mortal flesh. He begins his ministry by healing all that had need of healing. And he closes it by making on the cross a full atonement for our sin. Then on the other side of the open tomb, he passes into heaven, leaving the double commission for all the world and all the days, even unto the end of the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Now this conviction that drove the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, he did not go out to start a denomination. He went out to bring the gospel to the immigrant population that were not allowed to come into the church, who were not afforded the opportunity to go to doctors and made available the medicines that were uh, there in that day. So he brought a Jesus that met them with healing, deliverance, and salvation. And because of what he was seeing Jesus do and how the scripture was coming alive, other churches partnered with him and a movement began. In 1970, it would become a denomination. And that heart of, of what, this, what began the Christian Missionary Alliance is carried on today in our core value and our statement of faith. Provision is made in the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ for the healing of the mortal body. Prayer for the sick, anointing with oil, are taught in the scriptures and our privileges for the church in this present age. And you can find all of this on the Christian and Missionary Alliance website. That's, that's the denomination we're a part of. What I'm teaching is our inherited understanding and perspective of the scriptures. Regardless of who stands up here, that's just who the Christian Missionary Alliance is. But that doesn't qualify something as being truth from God's word. But if it is, which I believe it is, we're going to see it as we expound scripture today. Let's begin with a tale of two Adams. Romans chapter 5. Now there's a lot of scripture and I got that. And I put it in here because I know throughout the week we're reading, following up. And, and before we send the emails of Pastor Damien, I think you're wrong. I put these in here so that, that you, can, so you can see what I'm reading. Because sometimes I'm like, wait a minute, are we not reading the same thing? Listen to this. Romans chapter 5 now. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, we're talking about Adam, the very first, death through sin. So death has spread to all men because all have sinned. And men being mankind, women are included in this, not excluded. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. 
But sin was not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, and even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God, for the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of the righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so what this is saying is we have two Adams, the first one being the, create, the, the created being, the very first representative. And God bless you. Thank you so much. It's been a long 24 hours. Oh, hallelujah. That didn't work out. And for our next act. <clears throat> so Adam was created and he brought sin into the world. What happens in this picture? That means that he was connected to God in a life force that was eternal. There was no sin, therefore there was no disease, there was no brokenness, and ultimately there was no death. When he severed that relationship, death became his inevitable direction, his, his end game. And he slowly died every step of the way towards that. It's like a tree that loses its life source. You don't always see it in the moment, but you see it over a couple of years. The fruit starts to look funny and starts to show effects. It's infected. Something's wrong. Then it dries up. Leaves start disappearing. And suddenly you have a spring to where there's no life evident in that tree. That's what happens to all of us because of sin. Now that became universal because of Adam. But Jesus, being the second Adam, he comes in with grace. And this is not universally applied. It's universally offered. The difference is we all are born to inherit sin, but not all of us will know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We have to make the decision to embrace that. We have to respond to his call. And the moment that we do, eternal life is ours. We are plugged into a new life source. And over time, that eternal life starts breaking into our everyday moments. First, our soul is healed. We're forgiven. He sees no sin. And in the experiences of life, disease, and the effects of sin that touch us, the brokenness that affects us, we can know that healing because that's where we're plugged in. And that's what Paul's saying here with these two natures. But what Jesus is bringing into the world, grace and, and life, is healing. It's healing of the soul. It's healing of the body. And the two are together. Is this something new or has this always been God's design? I'm going to argue it's always been God's design because it's who God is. He's unchanging. And that's what I want to invite us to step into a little bit more here. In Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. Now I'm going to warn you, if you're reading this, make sure you start in verse 22. Don't read further or back anymore because I know some of us have issues with dancing and tambourines and praise and worship and celebration. And, and look, hey, these people really break out in praise and worship and it's off the hook. So don't read it. Don't read it. I'm warning you right now. Don't read it. Starting with verse 22. I mean, they were just delivered from generational bondage. I mean, can you imagine if we were delivered from sin, what our worship would look like? Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur and they were there three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what will we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it in the water. I was wondering if it was in the shape of a cross. And the water became sweet. Therefore, the Lord made for them a statute and a roll, and there he tested them, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Now, when it says the Lord God was testing them, understand this isn't God waiting for them to slip up and make a mistake. This is a parent who's trying to help their children mature in their faith. Okay, I delivered you as a nation from Egypt. I displayed the awesome power of my right hand 
against Pharaoh, against his army, against all that kept you shackled. I parted a sea, delivered you through. And will you, will you trust me that I'll also give you your daily bread? Will you trust me that I will give you the things that you need in every day, every moment of your life? I'm not just a God over the big things. I'm a God over the big things in your world too, in your life, in your circumstances. Now, there's a partnership here. Obedience is another word for faith. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey me, right? This is nothing new. This isn't old compared to new. This is who God is. Look, you touch the burner, you're going to get burned. <sighs> you hate me, Dad. No, I don't want to see you touch the burner and get burned. I don't want to hear you cry. It, it, it destroys part of my heart hearing you scream out in pain and then go through the healing journey. If we can avoid that, I'd love to do that. However, some of us need to touch the burner. And that's what God's saying with this. If you are obeying me, my word is truth. It's life. It will always lead you to know my favor, my blessings, the good that I intend to flow into you. What he was doing was showing them what happens if they plug back into God and allow him to be the source of their life. And in this, there's not disease. There's not ailment. Now, did people have disease throughout the Old Testament? Yes, they did. Did they get sick? Yes, they did. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But right up front, God is showing them that he desires not to, just to deliver them from Egypt, which we can look at as sin, but he wants to deliver them from the effects of sin, which is the illness. God cares for our individual needs, but we have to understand obedience. Obedience is what keeps us eating the food at the Lord's table. Getting a verdict from the doctor that we've got a, a, a cholesterol problem stinks. But at the end of the day, why do we have a cholesterol problem? Most of the time, because we're not exercising. And despite the fact that it says zero trans fat on that Cheeto bag, it's not doing any good for us. And see, obeying God, his word, keeps us eating from his table. His table, which is kingdom food that nourishes us and allows us to grow into the life that he has for us. But all along the way, we're always going to have vendors selling zero trans fat Cheetos. But we've got to avoid that. But all illness, and it's important, and I'm not saying this, all illness is not the result of personal sin. I am saying all illness is the result of sin. Sin, its presence has brought illness and it brings death. And that is a reality that we're all going to experience. Now, does personal sin bring the consequence of illness into our lives sometimes that's why scripture admonishes us when we are sick to reflect on the lord to look at him it's one of the blessings of fasting is that we deny ourselves the everyday pleasantries and we allow the spiritual hunger to find satisfaction in god and there's things even in my fast recently that he pointed out in my heart that i repented of pride being one of them it's amazing how pride just shows up, even when you think it's gone. Paul and Job, two examples. I don't know how long the sermon's going to go. I apologize, I'm not timing it. But Paul and Job, you have Job, who was allowed of God to experience tremendous hardship. And throughout the journey of Job, you find a man that, yes, he's suffered a lot, but it's not till the very end that his sense of self-righteousness finds death. And see, sometimes the journey of experiencing suffering is parts of our soul that God wants to claim. And it has to be squeezed out and dried up and die before God can come in and fill it. Yes, God wants all of your heart, and he'll get it. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, I've been beaten so many times, my back is more celebrated than a zebra with stripes. I've been stoned, I've been shipwrecked i've experienced imprisonment beatings i was healed from all of them but in that same letter he talks about how his body is dying what does that mean that means that like a battery we're charged up in our healing but as soon as we move on from it it doesn't hold the charge as long as it used to see we are healed all along the way of life but we're healed today to suffer and die another day but our faith allows us 
to know the eternal life that is our strength. So when he heals us, we move forward. And as we are healed, we continue to move forward knowing that we're going to die eventually. We're going to die eventually. And it got to the point for Paul to where he didn't know what he wanted to do more. He's been through so much. His battery's worn down. To go be with the Lord is, is great joy, but it's necessary for him to be here to continue to keep people faithful, to not turn away from God, and to believe that he is still their healer. Jesus is the living word. In John chapter 1, the gospel of John, Jesus would say in John 6 that if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will know life. But see, this partnership of obeying God and knowing the healing power that he can bring into us will always go hand in hand. It will always go hand in hand. I inserted this, the next point here, worship. We are who we are because of who he is. And I think this is important when we look at, we talk about raising a hallelujah in our circumstances. We talk about praising God and the despite ofs. See, who we are isn't determined by our circumstance. Even if we're sick, we're broken, God didn't answer the way we wanted and we're on the journey of healing, or he has and we have much reason to celebrate. And all of those things, the only source of our celebration is because of God's unchanging character of who he is. And I wanna bring this out a little bit because we're gonna get into some harder things here, but listen to this. Bless the Lord, Psalm 103, verses one through six. This is who we are. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all of your iniquity, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. This is who we are. But we are this because this is who God is. Verse 7, he has made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. If there's nothing that wants to birth out an amen and hallelujah, there's nothing else that will. Listen, he does not deal with you according to your sins. Is there anybody else that wants to shout out hallelujah at that? Because I will. Thank you, Jesus. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. But note, he removes them, but they go someplace. They don't just disappear. And that is the heart of healing, the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. He forgives us. He removes it, but it goes somewhere. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. As for man, his days are like the grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and the place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and all his kingdom rules over them. This is who God is. This is who he was, is, and always will be. And it's because of that, that there is nothing outside of God's word that is gonna go in any other direction than what God has declared. So we need to come to terms with what God has called sin and we need to stand firm on what God has called truth. We need to be transformed by the word of God and stop making excuse for not being transformed by the word of God. We need to stop being in partnership with Egypt because God is going to bring down judgment that is going to remove sin as well as Egypt. So stop misrepresenting who God is because it doesn't change him. Represent who God is and allow people to come before the living God and see the value of Jesus Christ. And this is the heart of our worship. This is the heart of our worship. This is why I always refer to worship as celebratory. Listen to this. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of the Lord. 
Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It matters not where we are at. And it's not that the Lord is insensitive to the suffering. It's not that he's insensitive. He understands the frailty. We celebrated him as our mediator. He is able to be our mediator because he is a high priest without sin. He knows how frail these bodies are. He knows how fragile our souls are. He knows how easily. Our feelings get hurt and our unanswered prayer from God affects us. And what does he do? Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I, I will embrace you in my peace, in my peace. And just like the hug of someone who loves us, there is so much therapeutically that happens in that moment. That's what Jesus invites us to come to him for. So regardless of where we are at, regardless if the circumstances that we're in have caught up to God's declaration, they will because of who God is. We are who we are because of who God is. But where did that sin go? How can God bring healing over the people of Israel? How was God able to pass over the houses that were in Egyptian bondage? Was there any power or magic in the blood of the lamb? No, it wasn't. The lambs that were slaughtered and put over there were a shadow. It was a debt that had to be satisfied. Every act of mercy, grace, and forgiveness that God extends both in the old, the new, and to us today is because of a debt that was satisfied on Jesus Christ. This is how I cannot look to Jesus and be any different than what the, who I am in him because of who he is. I cannot preach any message differently than the one that scripture testifies. Listen to this, Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, he had no majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Praise God for ugly pastors like me, because if you're attracted, it is the word of God. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we have gone astray like sheep scattered. We have all turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So to understand what the prophet is saying is that for God to declare us healed, someone had to be afflicted. For God to declare us holy, somebody had to suffer wrath. For God to declare us pure and his child, someone had to die. And it pleased, and this is such a profound theological reality that I just stand as if I'm a pebble in the universe between Father, Son, and Spirit. It pleased the Father to put all the sin on his Son. It pleased the Son to submit to the Father. And it pleased the Spirit to be in motion, bringing all of the things together in one perfect expression. So when we come to Jesus, he asks us, what will you have me do? Let the guards in your heart go away. Send them off. I asked too many times for healing. I asked too many times for this. I asked too many times for that. If someone sins against us 70 times, seven times, we're taught to forgive. For God to offer healing, it's because Jesus paid it all. When he was on that cross and he declared it is finished, up to that point and forever after that point, there is no sin laid on our charge. The law will never be able to stand before God and say, Damien has done this because the law is going to have to go through Jesus first. And it can't because he is greater than the law. He is greater than the law. And this is what empowers our message to go forth and declare 
in the declaration and demonstration of the gospel that he doesn't just save our souls from eternal damnation. He saves our bodies as well. There is an ultimate resurrection that is coming, but healing has always been an active tenant of the ministry of Jesus Christ from the beginning all the way up to his ascension. And in fact, if people are annoyed with that, he said, hey, look, you guys, you're going to even do more than what I've done. And I'm sending you out into the furthest regions of the world, into the furthest eons of the ages. Because until I return, which I will, even though sometimes our services seem like Jesus is dead and gone, and he's not coming back. And I'm not speaking to us, I'm just speaking church in general. We forget that Jesus is alive and that Jesus is coming back. But when he does come back, that's when sin is going to be permanently removed and gone. But until then, we sing, we celebrate because of all that God has done, all that God is doing, and what he will do. That is our faith that is unshaken because it is the thus saith the Lord. It will come to pass. So again, every act of deliverance, healing, forgiveness, every drop of grace and mercy that God gives was a building debt that Jesus satisfied. Grace is free to us because Jesus paid the cross, paid the price on the cross and declared it is finished. When Jesus came on the scene in the gospels, he was, the gospels are like this transition period. You have John the Baptist who embodied the last and the greatest of the prophets and that voice of the Old Testament coming into the new with Jesus Christ here and now. And the final declaration of, of the man who would embody the law and the heart of God pointed everything that he was and is to Jesus saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the sole purpose of the Old Testament's existence, to point us to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why Paul's going to write in Galatians that the law was meant to be a tutor that walks alongside of us. No, stop looking at the Cheetos. Look at the table that's prepared for you. Zero tra trans fats. I got it. But look to the nourishment that's coming for you. Everything in the Old Testament was to prepare us for this. But it wasn't just life that we look forward to in the eternal. It is the eternal breaking into the everyday moments. Why? Because we are plugged back into the life source through Jesus Christ. And that's why Matthew bears witness. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. And Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, give her the strength to hush down and suffer strongly. No, what did he say? Luke records that he asked Jesus to heal her. Verse 15 of Matthew, he touched her hand and the fever left her. She rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what we just read in the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. This was the active ministry of Jesus. It wasn't just declaration. It was demonstration. When you read the Gospels aside, again, I'm not going to drive this point home enough. If we read the Gospels with open, unfiltered eyes, we are going to see that they reek of the declaration and demonstration of the kingdom of God. Unless Jesus is teaching a message. And the same thing with the book of Acts. We are coming to Acts 15. It is a sermon that was already written. And God said, no, this is it for this weekend. Okay. But Acts 15, when they're facing the issue of, do we require believers to be circumcised? Do they just go to the law? No. What did Paul and Barnabas do? If you read it, you're going to read that they went all over the coast bearing witness of the signs and wonders that Jesus did with the Gentiles. He is healing everything that he began is continuing through us and is exploding into the Gentiles now. It is always declaration and demonstration. So our representation of the gospel must be the same. Otherwise, we're not representing him. It doesn't matter what the theological discussion, debate, argument is. Read the scriptures. We don't go to Paul to understand Jesus. We go to Jesus to understand Paul in the writings of the New Testament. The gospels are the centrality of this. And if we miss that and we try to fit Jesus in a theological box that's been transliterated into our context with the axes to grind from people who are afraid, are concerned, or have seen something abused, we're going to miss Jesus. And I, for one, am not going to be a part of proclaiming a gospel that misses Jesus. Not in any way, not in any short shape. Will not fall short. God willing. So what do we look at so far? We saw that through two Adams, one brought death, death and brokenness and illness. 
The second Adam brought grace and healing. Healing has always been God's will for his people. We see that in the deliverance of Israel and Egypt. We see that it was a, we worship God in this. No matter what we're suffering, we can raise our hallelujah because of who God is. And because of who God is, his word is truth. And we will know perfect healing. Why? Because it was paid for by Jesus. And finally, what is the present ministry of the gospel? What does it to look like for us today? Do we have something right in the Christian Missionary Alliance? When we share a full, fourfold gospel with Jesus being our savior, our healer, our sanctifier, and our king. Let's look at Jesus and the 12. Remember when, uh, this is kind of funny if you think about it. When God delivered Israel from Egypt, he led them to a place that had how many springs of water? 12. And how many palm branch trees? 70. 70. It's interesting. Coincidence, right? So Jesus calls and empowers, oh, I don't know, what's a good number? 12. Let's go with that. Luke 9, listen to this. And he called the 12 together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure disease. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. But Lord, I really like the second one. No. Whatever house you enter, <laughs> stay there. Stay there. I always, you know, every time it comes time to move and I have to box, not my clothing, my closet can fit neatly into a, a small bag. Well, no, brother, come on now. Come on now. Come on now. It's plain dirty. It's kingdom investment. <laughs> Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there, uh, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the village, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Preaching and healing. Partnership. Again, but does it end with the 12? No, 12 is not enough. So now Jesus goes, and I don't know, let's go with 70. Or if you're reading the English Standard Version, it'll say 72, a transliteration on the Hebrew. But after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, every town, a place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Why? Because there are empty seats at the wedding table. Go into the streets, go into the gutters, go into furthest regions where you're going to find a human heart beating and invite them to come to my table. So Jesus sends them out and he says, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. You're on a mission. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if there is a son of peace in there, your peace will rest upon it. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. But do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Go into its streets and say, even the dust, if it doesn't receive you, go into the streets. Even if the dust would cling, your town will fall from us as the dust does from our feet. We're wiping it off. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. And I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. The 70 returned with joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Imagine that debriefing. The 70 come back. Lord, look, I, I saw you do it. I heard you say that we're going to do it. Even the demons at the, the speaking of your name submit to the authority that comes forth from that. I love this. And he said to them, behold. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Keep the focus on the eternal of what's happening. It is God's kingdom coming. And as we continue to move into that, our ministry is to bear witness and declaration and demonstration of the gospel to afford others to come with us into this kingdom. But what does that mean for us today? Was this to extend beyond the 12, beyond the 70? Listen to this in Mark 16. And he, Jesus, said to them, 
Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any, any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. And again, just a caveat for those that are reading or watching this saying, Pastor, you know that text is argued in scripture if it should be included or not. Here, listen, everything that was just read is found in other parts of the New Testament except for the drinking of poison. So receive it or not, it is God's word. It is the expression of his ministry in motion. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does the ministry of the gospel, if this is the baton that we've been handed, what does it look like for us as a local church? What does this gospel in declaration and demonstration look like with you and I here at Cornerstone Chapel today? In James 5, James writes, if is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders, the servant leaders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Whether it's personal sin or just the nature of sin in general, that's the source of illness. So always take opportunity to be a positive part of someone's life, breathing scripture into them, praying over them and interceding, even if you don't get a thank you from them, even if you don't see the fruit of the gospel rooting and flourishing in their lives, don't stop praying and interceding because we know not what God is doing beyond the invitation to come and to pray and allow the spirit to lift our prayers and partner in a two becoming one mystery of the sovereign will of God coming and unfolding in the world that you and I live in. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain for three days, six months and did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. And I'll forever remember the way that Gary so eloquently expounded this text in the sense of, 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 of the, the strenuousness of a woman going into labor is the strenuousness that Elijah poured into his prayer. What does intercession look like? And he continues, my brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Why does James add that to this? Because listen, we all have a right to come before Jesus and ask him for healing. It is the will of God to heal. He may move in ways that do not lead us to see the healing the way we prayed and wanted. And because of that, our hearts get wounded. Our hearts break. Our souls need to know his healing touch. That's all a part of it. We're not just talking about physical healing. We're talking about spiritual soul healing. Because we can fix everything on the outside. What did Jesus say often to the people that he healed? Go and do what? No more. Say no more. Don't keep doing the things that are breaking your soul and disconnecting you from God. See, what happens with apostasy? Apostasy is when people walk away from God. That means they were walking with him at one point. For whatever reason, something happened in life that they're broken. They've not found healing, and they've walked away from God. What James is inviting us as the body of Christ to be a healing ministry is one that is actively, not just in intercession, but being the body of Jesus to those who inwardly are suffering too. So that they don't walk away from God. But they come back and to know his peace and the refuge that he alone is. Because ultimately, there is eternity, eternity without sin, without the effects of sin. All the goodbyes that we feel like we should not have had to say in this world. 
and I, and, I, and I put myself out there with this as well. I'm not preaching something that I'm not living. That's why I'm going back to Ohio, and I, my family's not watching this. My grandparents buried two out of three of their children. And for whatever reason, every time I'm sitting there with them, why am I still alive? We've had to watch all of our friends die. We've buried two out of three of our children, and we just saw the spouse of our surviving child die. If there is a God, why are we still here? Why did we have to go through that? See, that's the ministry that I step into when I go on vacation. And my heart breaks and bleeds over that. Because only Jesus can heal that. And I show them when I go there, look at the grandkids playing on the floor. We laugh, we smile, we celebrate the life that we have here right now. But in Jesus, there is no goodbye. It's just temporary, but there is a reunion that will come, that we will know no sin and we will know no death. Why are you still here? I don't know, Grandma and Grandpa, other than the fact that you're not healed. And if you would die today, I'm never going to see you again. And that weighs on my heart. So yes, you're suffering right now, but my prayer is that through the suffering, you know healing in life, in Jesus Christ. That's not an easy message to say but it's the only one that I've got. Be mindful of those who are suffering around us. We're called to be the healing ministry of Jesus. As is, it's not just physical, it's also spiritual. It's not just spiritual, it's also physical. And this is where I get people that, listen, John wrote, longest living disciple, beloved, through John 2, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. He saw their soul and their bodies in partnership in the health and the healing that Christ brings. When I come before Jesus and I pray, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, I come before the God who can do anything. I am not going to come before the God who can do anything and begin with God, give them the strength to endure this. I begin with God, at your word, they can be healed. I don't read in the scripture where people bring loved ones to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, give them the strength to endure this well. They come to him in the most boldest expression of satisfaction to the need that they have. Allow Jesus to say, I'm going to give you strength. Don't be the one that appeals to that right off the bat. I just, I, I, I can't. And if that's just me, then that's just me. For my wife, I'm not going to fall short and, and pray for complete full healing. For my children, I am not going to fall short from ever praying for complete full healing. Now, if God answers in different ways, I'm going to love him and I'm going to allow him to heal the broken expectation in my heart and continue, God willing, to keep my knee bowed and confess that he is Lord and Savior. But healing comes from the reality that Jesus has paid it all and at his word he can. He didn't today, I'm going to pray tomorrow. He doesn't tomorrow, I'm going to pray again and again and again until there is no breath in the body. That's the gospel. It goes forth in declaration. It goes forth in demonstration. That's the hope that is ours. So the question that I have is, why doesn't the world see that when they look at us? I was raised to believe that the spiritual gifting died with the apostles. And the churches that I've been a part of, you'd believe that. Because there was no evidence of it. Our faith. God tested Israel when he led them from Egypt to mature their faith. So he could pour into them and explode out into all the world. Allow God to test your faith. Allow God to mature your faith. Allow God to stretch your faith to where at, wherever you are at. You know that in Jesus Christ, you are safe and healed, even if your circumstances haven't caught up to that. And you can raise a hallelujah that makes no sense to doctors. It makes no sense to nurses. It makes no sense to family. But they are not plugged into what you are through faith in Jesus Christ. And so as a ministry, my prayer in my heart is that we are a full gospel representation and declaration and demonstration. And this flows into a time of intercession. Many of us have accepted the invitation to fast. And the invitation was specific to pray for healing for those who are sick. We have those that are with us virtually that are wanting healing. There are those that are here that want to know the healing of Jesus Christ. Not just in the body, but in the spirit. But as well as in the body. And I want to invite you, 
as our worship team comes forward. This song.